I don't think really anyone truly misses the racing that much. With the weekend worries, it's always like going out absolutely crushing themselves and then taking a full week to recover and you can't do anything during the week. It continues with that cycle over and over again. If you consistently ride your bike, you're gonna consistently get better. I had the privilege of sitting down with Christian Vandeveld, who rode in the Tour de France 11 times during his pro career. We dug into day-to-day -day life during the tour, things like what really goes on in between stages. But the most valuable part for me was when Christian started sharing what his relationship with cycling looks like now after his pro career. And keep an eye out at the end for some incredible advice he gives for new riders like us. Christian is one of the founding members of The Breakaway, an app that lets you measure yourself against previous efforts and against riders your same weight and age. I mentioned the app briefly in an earlier video where I tried to ride as fast as Tadej Pogaccia, and a lot of you were curious about the app in the comments. Christian and the team at The Breakaway saw that video, reached out to chat, and this part is really cool. They're giving us all a free two-month trial of the app. There's a link in the description. You can download it now and immediately compare your numbers to Christian and other pros. And you can even add me to your team. I don't know why you want to do that, but you can see how we compare. A big thank you to Christian and the entire team at The Breakaway. And now, please enjoy watching me fumble through my first proper interview. Lucky for all of us, Christian is a literal pro and a generous interviewee with a wealth of knowledge. He is a two-time Olympian, a decorated track cyclist who transitioned to world tour cyclist Rode from 2008 to 2013, rode in the Giro d'Italia multiple times, Tour de France multiple times, had a huge impact on the sport then and continues to now. He's a sports analyst for NBC, a guest instructor for Peloton, and also a founding member of the Breakaway app. Christian, how'd I do? You did pretty good. It was, it was 1998 that became pro, but not, so you, you, you shortchanged me 10 years, but- Oh, oh sorry. It was great to be here, man. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. I mean, I imagine this like time of year, we're in the thick of the Tour de France, is very busy for you. It, it is busy, and it's it's more you know I'm doing this remote, unfortunately, for the last three years since COVID, and uh, so I, I'm in Connecticut, New York, and yeah, so it's more the time zone change. So like mm -hmm. getting up at three thirty in the morning, that kind of thing is that's so yeah, I'm I'm way past my bedtime right now. <laughs> we were talking a little bit before we started recording. I'm very new to cycling. This is the first year that I'm watching the tour. Everything's very exciting and very fresh to me. If we could kind of go back in time a little bit, what were your earliest member memories of the Tour de France? Well, this is perfect. I mean, I, I love speaking to people who are new to the sport. So there's no stupid questions because it is so nuanced in the sport and it is so insane. Speaking of my first Tour de France in 1999 to today, the changes are exponential. We were, for example, one of the first teams, if we were the first team to have a chef with us. It's crazy to think that, but you were truly at the mercy of whatever that hotel had for food back then. I mean, that that's mind blowing to me yeah. to think about that. So, oh shit, we ran out of pasta. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, what? So, so that was a big uh, change within the sport, just having cooks, having dietary. And really the reason we had a cook then was just so we didn't get sick. So we didn't get food poisoning. Um, so yeah, it was just, the biggest eye-opening experience for me from any other race to the Tour de France when I first did my first one was just the scale of it. Everything was bigger. Everything was louder. Everything, there was just so much more to do. You were just so much more hyped up. The racing was faster. Um, everything was bigger and better, honestly. And people will always say still to this day, like, oh, it's just in any race. You know, don't get too nervous. No, it's not any other race. It's it's a big deal. And if you have success in it, it, it could truly change your life. And everyone races just like it, it can change your life. I'm going to take you up on that offer. The, there's no stupid questions. We'll see if I can if I can get one. The tour to me was like, okay, so I wake up and I watch the start of a stage and then the stage ends and then the next day goes on. I'm just really curious, like what happens between the end of one stage and the start of the next? No, that's a great question. Um, I, there, there's a race within the race. Who's the first bus to leave in the parking lot to go into the next hotel? And so it's always kind of a hurry up kind of thing because the second the race ends you're already thinking of trying to recover as fast as possible to the next one. if you could do it in, in a timely manner or make it more efficient um for example you know the buses got bigger and bigger the first grand tour that I ever did we had a station wagon man we had a passat <laughs> no. yeah we had well we had two of them and we just all smashed in there and a lot of times you're just changing in the back seat just like you would if you're an amateur at any other local bike race and that's how it was for everybody. And then they got campers and they got buses. 
Um, and now, so everyone has pretty much a first class seat inside the bus. There's showers in there. So you, you immediately, now they, we cool down right after the race, you'll see mm-hmm. a cool down protocol. That's only, we, we started that on our team like 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Um, before just, you would come across the line at threshold and just jump in the bus and take a shower. There is no cool down. There's no nothing. It's like everything you learned as an amateur was thrown out the door. You didn't warm up. You just kind of just race flat out and just hope for the best. So now there's a, at least 10 to 15 minutes on the trainer at the bus uh, to cool down a little bit, go take a shower. Um, then we brought in rice cookers on the bus. So you'd have better food. It used to be just a sandwich, just a local deli sandwich, something like that, which is just you know, it's crap, right? Yeah. So now we're bringing in better nutrition, shakes, those kind of things. So all that's on the bus with you. So you usually have a transfer of anywhere from, if you're lucky, 30 minutes to sometimes it could be hour and a half. Sometimes in the tour of Italy, it could be two hours, um, a lot longer than you would expect. And so this already puts you, if you're finishing the stage at 5, 5.30, 6.30, let's say you get to the, the hotel, suitcase is already in your room, which is nice with your most likely you have a roommate one of your teammates and then you just go up in your room, sometimes take a shower. Cause again, because just cause the shower in the bus is not exactly a shower. It's more rinsing off mm-hmm. um, mas- massage. If you've had a crash, you go see the doctor, make sure you get some new plasters on you, clean that, clean the, the wounds up. Um, chiropractic care. If you have that, or if you need that physiotherapist um, and there's usually three or four of them. So you have to you know make sure that, okay, Mitch, you go first, I'll go second, catch up with your family, do some interviews on the phone, whatever you may need. I used to do an article for the Chicago Tribune, just things like that. And before you know it, it's 8.30, 9 o'clock, and you try to at least, that's the one time of the day that everyone can have a civilized conversation. A lot of times you don't even talk about the race. You just want to just kind of decompress. And it's always nice if you could have the team together at that time and not having Mitch coming in from a massage and then go someone else going out, you know, try not to have phones, try to, the, you just really honestly just try to be civilized. And you can always see the teams who have good morale because they're laughing and having a good time. And then by that time, time it's, it's already nine 30, 10 o'clock. You go, go back to your room, try to relax a little bit. If you can, I mean, and sleep by 10 o'clock, I mean, sorry, getting in bed by 10 o'clock, maybe get to bed by midnight. I mean, because you're still so amped up. There's just, yeah. like I was saying, it's everything's bigger. So there's always just, you're getting more phone calls from people who are excited to t- talk to you, but we're watching you on TV or radio shows back home or TV. There's just that much more attention, I would say. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot that goes on. It's a great question after the race happens to try to recover as fast as you possibly can for the next day. Wow, I imagine. Are all the teams like interacting then at the hotel? Are you all in the same hotel or are there different places? How'd that yeah, work? It, it's, it's, a, it's a lottery really for where you're going to be to a certain extent. So there's a point system. And I don't know if this is true or not, but we, we've it, it's supposed to be true that every team should end with, let's say, 100 points at the end of the Tour de France. So one day you might be in this gorgeous chateau and the next day you could be in this uh, campagnol, which is really like about as small as you possibly can. So it's a chain in France. And so the Campagnol might be one point, but the, the Chateau is five points and everyone should equal out. You just hope that you have the good hotels like on a rest day or a time that you could actually appreciate being in a nice bedroom. Um, honestly, all I really cared about was having air conditioning mm-hmm. and a clean room. You'd be surprised how many times, especially when you have a heat wave or something that you don't have air conditioning and you, you're so hot because you're, processing all this food you've been eating and you just can't stop sweating. Then that deters from your recovery because you're not sleeping because you're sitting there just laying on top of your sheets all night and sweating. So that happens a lot as well, because you have to remember that you're in rural France and with hundreds and thousands of other people all trying to get the same place. And if you have 22 teams and also staff, the people who need to put the barricades up and all those things, it's a, it's a moving carnival. So there's only so many hotels and sometimes your hotel could be in the middle of nowhere. So yeah, once in a while, you, I would say more times than not, you're interacting. You're not alone as a team at the hotel, which it's really nice when you are the only people you don't have to go and look at your competitors. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sometimes you could be at dinner and before we all had chefs and things like that, you could have seven, eight teams in the same dining hall, all sitting at different tables all over the place. And it's the last thing you would want to do is be looking over at the guy that you hate or keep on bumping Uh into the belt. 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Can you imagine the Blackhawks with the Islanders having dinner together? I mean, no. during the Stanley Cup? No, it's, it's just not going to happen. So, I mean, <laughs> these, these are kind of things that I never thought were weird just because I never experienced anything different. But as I'm explaining to this to you, yeah. I realize how ridiculous it all is. That's so crazy to have, yeah, all these rivals together in the same room. Is there anything you really miss about that experience? Yeah, I would say all of my peers who are retired around the same time that I still stay in contact with. I don't think really anyone truly misses the racing that much. It's 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 just so it just it's a lot. We got we got our fill, right? I was lucky enough to have a, a long career of 16 years as a pro. I don't, I don't need to do it anymore. But I truly miss the camaraderie. I truly miss being in the bus, whether it was a shit show in the race and everything went sideways or we won the race and everything in between, you know, just unloading those stories, guys pinging, having all that adrenaline flowing and really just being a band of brothers, you know, the, the good years and the good teams, it, it was a special feeling. And, and that that's one thing I definitely miss. What helped the team kind of feel like, like a band of brothers? Mm, you know, it was always a different, uh, chemistry i would say there was years where we had a little bit older crew so we always were just a little bit more mature um and then a lot other times you just have uh, you know you could have younger guys who are just a little bit more uh, it, it really didn't matter what the ages were it just really was the chemistry within the team and people um just keeping that alive and it's not easy just like a relationship it's it's not easy to keep that in a positive direction all the time there's definitely years that were you know magic and there's other times it was just kind of like you're just kind of going through the emotions and it felt like a job. But the days that those are the years that are magic, I think it always shows in the results as well. Now that you're not a pro cyclist anymore, are you still finding way? Like, do you still ride with people? Do you still have a group yeah. that you kind of have a similar camaraderie with? Yeah. You know, I would, to be honest with you, when I retired, I, I was over cycling, you know, I mm -hmm. thought I, I would never ride again. You know, I had a lot of injuries, broke way too many bones to ride. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm done. And I was living in Chicago at the time where, where I grew up and that got old real fast. So I was like, I realized that I missed it a lot. And then I would, I would only ride if someone like yourself would call me up. I was like, yeah, of course I'd go ride with anybody. But then later on, I moved down to Greenville, South Carolina, where, uh, George Hincapie lived and I've been training with him, my old teammate. I would ride with him all the time after that. And then I really got that love of cycling back. And then Bobby Julik moved over. So then also we had three of us who had ridden, I don't know how many Tour de France's together, you know, over 30 Tour de France's together in, in many years of, of history. So that, that is, that's been really fun and, and a special, special part of our lives to be able to, to still share that deep into our four. Well, Bobby's 50 now. He can still kill us, but he's, he's, <laughs> That's cool. What is a what is a ride with the three of you look like now? Uh just you know, just just like honestly, it's maybe it's, it's it's all relative, right? It's a little bit faster than your average ride, but at the same time, it's just it's the same conversation, same shit talking, same same as any other <laughs> three, three knuckleheads going out for a bike ride, you know. And I think that's that's the beauty of it, isn't it? I mean, and the, I think the the biggest part of that is it's those days that you didn't really want to go ride, but someone asked you to go out and they they drag you out. And I think that is one of the, the best part of, of having those kind of friends um, to make sure you're, you know, keep you honest. Why'd you end up in South Carolina? Uh, just quality of life, really. My, my jobs were, took me everywhere, but nowhere. And um, I'd moved from, I lived in Spain, Girona, Spain for 16 years. And then we moved back to where my wife and I both grew up in the burbs of Chicago, um, just because we've been, you know, near our parents and for our, our kids' grandparents, obviously. And after a year or two, we're like, no, we're not <laughs> in the burbs. So, so George was a big proponent of that to, to bring down south. And now you're doing a bunch of different stuff. So you're an analyst for NBC, guest instructor for Peloton, and the, the Breakaway app. How are you splitting up your time through all these like big projects? Yeah, right. Right now, it's not easy. During the Tour de France, it's 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 not easy, and it's mostly yeah. like I was telling you before. It's it's just really the the time zone and just being up so early. You know, three thirty in the morning this morning. So uh, th that's what kind of hurts you. Um, that said, the breakaway has been a blast, man. And this is this has been something uh, of a passion project with one of my friends um, who's worked at Strava early on. And he would always make fun of me, Mitch, about being a Peloton instructor. He's like, what does your life become? You're a spin instructor. Now you're a total sellout. Um, 
So that that's pretty funny how it started there. And uh-huh. then he got a Peloton bike himself and then realized like he got better just because he was finally doing intervals. Mm-hmm. Uh, he moved to a colder climate. And then that spurred on the whole conversation of, you know, is it this easy? Can we just, can we help people out? What's next? And how, you know, how do we push them forward? Yeah. And now we're, we're here where we are today. And this has been over the last year and a half, two years or so in the making. And honestly, it, it's been a, it, it's been part, you know, going to, get my business degree and also just uh, uh, like I said earlier just it's a passion project of, of doing what I love and helping other people get better that's awesome yeah I, I've been kind of like playing around with it and it's a lot of fun so I live in LA just an excuse that I think even if I didn't live in LA it'd be impossible for me to get a KOM at this point <laughs> just for the level writer I am so it's nice to have a different kind of like metric that compares me to more people myself. And that was really exciting to me. I think it's a cool app. What are you excited about on the horizon there? I like that. Well, I think that it was a case in point because, you know, leaderboards are, are, are broken for the most part, for most people, right? I mean, I can't get a camera. Okay. Peloton rides, right? Yeah. I can do my own Peloton ride. And if I'm in the top 10%, that I kill myself. And so it's like, how does this make any sense? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm number thousand out of my own ride. And like, I, no. So <laughs> I, it, I, we love the you versus you. And, you know, you're stronger than you think. And I, I love beating that drum over and over again. And so I'm really excited about that. What we have in the pipeline coming out in the next week or so is really just complete game changing as far as our, our app has come or platform has come along. Um, being able to look back. I mean, I always love to compare myself to where was I this year? Was I, was I fitter during, when I was doing the Tour de France in Stanford last year? Was I riding more? And so being able to compare those metrics from today, last week, last month, and see progress, um, see where I stood here today, um, see where I'm going. Those are the things that really excite me, being able to see that, that longitudinal view of what your training is and really just try to simplify it. We don't have to have all this noise out there. There's just a, a few different things we have to really focus on. And after that, we're just going to get better. And I think intuition as well, slowly but surely, you're going to start to learn this and learn more about your body. And I think if we do that, we won. I like what you said about uh, like you don't need all of the information. There's just like a few little key bits. And as somebody who's new to cycling, that helps me <laughs> feel a little less overwhelmed because there's so many things and it is really exciting. But I think it's really easy to kind of get lost in all of the data truly truly there, there's, there's so much right now well i got this and my my this score tells me i'm not ready but it's like well yeah but if you blocked out your weekend to go ride you're gonna go bike go ride your bike you know so it yeah. doesn't matter what this score tells you the night before that, that you didn't sleep enough or this or that you need to have a mechanism that we could at least focus on what truly matters and just simplify that and just go ride your bike and try to be better than you were yesterday. Well, Christian, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking time again uh, during this very busy time of year for you. A last question for you. What advice would you give to somebody like me if you could only give one little piece of advice for somebody who's just starting their journey in road cycling? I mean, if I'm going to keep it crazy simple, I'm just going to say consistency. I mean, if, if there's anything with the weekend worries, it's always like going out and absolutely crushing themselves and then taking a full week to recover and can't do anything during the week and then complete continuous with that cycle over and over again. If you consistently ride your bike, you're going to consistently get better as well. Just like putting a penny in the piggy bank every time you're going to keep on building that. So consistency, I know I'm dumb in the dumb big time here, but really just trying to go time and time and time again. And then if I can take one more step, I love being able to compare myself on the same kind of rides every once in a while and just have that litmus test of where I stand. So if you're in LA, you've got all those gorgeous canyons, pick one of those once in a while. Pick the one that you like. If it's Latigo, which was my favorite canyon, I like to go and test myself and see what kind of time I did. And that always told me where my form really was. And that makes it relative to yourself, exactly. You know, if it took me an hour to go up to Latigo, it took me an hour. But if it took me 25 minutes, I knew it was going pretty quick. Hey, well, I hope you enjoy the tour and thanks for watching. And uh, I mean, I'm still blown away at what these guys do on the bike. I'm a massive fan. I mean, I can't understand how they go as fast as they do. I saw you doing your, you comparing yourself of, of what it'd be like to heck PB <laughs> <laughs> ride next to Tandy Pagacha. And I did that insane. the other day with uh, Watt Van Art. Um, uh-huh. He did when he went to a stage victory the other day, he did something astronomical for one minute and 45 seconds. And I tried to hold that just the other day you yeah. know, after the show. And I, 
I couldn't eat, barely hold that sprinting for like 20 to 30 seconds. So you're not alone. Mitch. It, is, <laughs> it, it, it is absolutely ridiculous and it is awe inspiring. And uh, yeah, it's, it's cool to be able to compare yourself and we got some, some great pros coming on the breakaway. So you could compare your, your power numbers um, if you want to. I mean, it depends on what kind of how you wake up in the morning. You, you <laughs> yeah. want to humble yourself that bad. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. There's some days where I need like a good dose of reality. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, yeah, take cool. care of yourself. Great to talk to you. Thanks. You too.